Hey everybody, welcome back to the 63rd episode of Taps and Patience. I am AJ with Audacity Micro. <laughs> and here with Harrison of Precision Ingenuity. Nice Hi Harrison, how are you doing? Doing good, yourself? I, I know where I work, it's okay. Um, I know who I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, I have a special announcement to all of our listeners. A big milestone has been reached in the podcast today. For the first time in the last year and a half, Harrison and I have exchanged phone numbers. <laughs> We've always talked over Instagram, and for the first time, um, we can we can talk via via text. Mostly because I uninstalled Instagram, and I'm taking a um, a break from Instagram for a couple weeks or a month, so it's been harder for us to communicate. But I just thought that was funny that for the first time, Harrison and I finally exchanged phone numbers. I find it funny that I exchanged numbers with Dylan before I did with you. Did you? And, I've, <laughs> <laughs> and that was and that was only yesterday because um, I or was it yesterday or it was someday this week we were. We were dealing with, uh, I had some questions about where, and we were going back and forth on Instagram, and I was like, let's just, can we talk on the phone real quick? That'd be real quick. And so we traded numbers and hashed that out, but we can talk about that later. Speaking but, yeah. of Dylan, though, huge shout out to Dylan, Dylan Jackson from Proteum Machining. He sent me an extra flux vice that he had laying around. Um, and I really, really appreciate that because I really needed something more than just the uh, the mod vice that I've been using for op ones. Uh, it's one of the older aluminum ones which is mm-hmm. interesting to kind of see some of the differences. There's a little bit more play in it. Um, it's definitely lighter, though, which is, I guess, kind of nice. Um, it also doesn't mount directly to the um, Saunders Machine Works table, but I can use toe clamp, so that's fine. Now, does it... Um, is it anodized aluminum, or is it just raw? It is. Or um, there's like that weird like chem coating. It might be that. <clears throat> okay but it's not aluminum colored it's at least it got something on there okay okay and it's probably 70 75 yeah who knows instead of 60 61 I- ken is it 70 75 <laughs> he'll send me a message then we'll know there you go okay um so what have you been up to oh it was the holidays it was so- the holidays <clears throat> got to run around like a madman for that which is you know every every year you get a little bit older it seems like the holidays become less relaxing and more stressful as you, as you start being the one that's responsible for getting people together and doing things and yep and as your family grows as kids it was a lot easier <laughs> i know right <laughs> yeah you should try having three kids <laughs> <laughs> but no it was a, it was good um it was nice to get away from the shop but it's you know it's one of those funny things i never missed work until i really started a business and then like you get so invested in what you're doing from a day to day that like you you leave for a little while and it's like man i kind of want to go back and do some yeah. more work like I, I enjoy what i'm doing like it's fulfilling and i want to go back and do more yep so um but yeah it was pretty good um Played some flag football with some people, nice. uh, shot some skeet, uh, played some games. Brothers came into town. Just normal Thanksgiving stuff. Yep. So, yeah, I took, you? I, I took a couple of days off for Thanksgiving. It's kind of been slow for the last week for me. Uh, a part of that being that, you know, Thanksgiving was like, you know, Thanksgiving's Thursday and then Friday off and then it's the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. So that's like, you know more than half of my week that was gone right there. And then the the last couple days, I had ordered some stuff like right before Thanksgiving. It was probably like Wednesday night, I placed order for materials and tooling for the jobs that I have coming up. And so, you know, those didn't get shipped until like Monday and mm-hmm. they just got here today. So I've spent basically the last two days just doing cam. And then today I finally got to, you know, spin back up the mill and, and make a part. Yeah. So are you finding that when parts are running, you have enough time to cam up the next part? Or are you watching the machine? Or what are you doing while it's running? Um, sometimes it, it can go either way. 
a lot of the parts I've been running have not been long cycle times. So generally I am there just running the mill. And let's see, I the job I have coming up next has three parts with a quantity of four of each. And this mm-hmm. is like my biggest run that I've had on Zometry since at least uh, since I think it was my second job that was a quantity of 60. But those were some pretty simple low um, precision parts. So this is like my first one that's a little bit higher precision and is also a longer runtime. So um, what's your total job count at this point? I think last time we talked, it was around seven. Yeah. So I believe the um, one that I'm talking about now is number 10. I finished number eight and nine this week. I think number eight went yesterday. Number nine went today. Okay. So once you're done with 10, in theory, you should be uh, passing out of that probationary zone. Yes. Um, it, uh, on some level. I don't I don't know if there's like how many probationary zones they have, mm-hmm. um, but you'll get out of at least probably the first level of it. Yeah, that'll be nice to see some more jobs in my job board and be able to take more. Because I, with the three job cap, I felt a little bit limited because it's like, you know, it takes a couple <clears throat> days to get tooling and it takes a couple days to get material. And mm-hmm. like when you're planning these jobs two or three weeks out, like, a, I don't know, only having three pl- to plan isn't enough time. Or excuse me, yeah. it's too much time. I have I have a lot of open spindle time right now. Yeah. But with that said, have you had other work that you've been able to backfill some with? Like, I know you're still doing some stuff for design the everything. Like have, have you just had zones where you're literally just sitting there staring at the computer waiting for more work or have you always had something to keep you busy? I, so the job I have coming up, the next one, the one that's um, three parts at four each, the cam on it is fairly complicated. And so I have been working on the cam. Okay. Uh, that's literally what I have done all this week is is work on cam. And I, I would like to be able to mix it up a little bit more. I don't want to just cam for two days straight and then machine for two days straight. Like it, you know, after about four hours of cam, I am not working at peak efficiency. And mm-hmm. so I like to be able to kind of alternate more. Yeah. Well, in an ideal world, what we try to do is we try to cam while parts are running. Yes. We try to get long cycle parts. Um, and then while they're running, you're working on the next job or, or or setting up the next machine or cutting material or, you know, there's inspecting parts. There's a lot of things you can be doing while it's running. Yeah. If you got everything set up well. So. Yeah. And let's see, the complicated job I have coming up, there's two parts that are are pretty simple. They're not quite just blocks with holes, but they're pretty close. Just a two hop part. A little bit of surfacing in there with a small end mill, but that's the worst part. And then it comes to the, the peak part. And that's the one that's like a quarter with two NPT fittings attached. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll be just a huge amount of work. Um, The way I have it set up, I think it's going to be six operations. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't know. It, it just is what it is. It's a small, complicated part with some some weird geometries on there that'll be really hard to machine. So the only way to do it is just to kind of approach it systematically and go slow. Mm-hmm. So, fair enough. Oh, let's see here. So, um, <laughs> my plan of having a dead couple weeks at the end of December has <laughs> kind of vanished. Yeah. And so, I've ended up with a lot of work that's now pushed me into the beginning of next year. And so I got to figure out when I can get some time to go work in the new shop so we can start moving over. So that being said, my dad and my uncle have been working on the new shop and nice. over Thanksgiving, we were able to get in there and do a little bit of work as well. Okay. So, so we did do some work over the holidays and, um, uh, it's completely gutted. Um, me and my cousin, uh, there was a bunch of stuff that was hanging from the ceiling. And so we spent about a half a day out there and, <coughs> and got all that down, which is really nice. Um, we've been working on, our dad's been working on the uh, the bathrooms, building up new bathrooms and getting them set up. The old, build, the old bathrooms in the old building, they were like 
right next to the wall to the point where if you were sitting on a toilet, you'd be basically leaned over because the wall's like right there. <laughs> I hate that. That's the worst. Yeah. yeah. And so um, they actually dug up the concrete and got some oh, offset wow. flanges to like move them over. I think they got them five inches on center line over, which it's still going to be really close to the wall, but it'll be way better than it was. Yep. So, but it'll be nice when those are done and we actually have a, a bathroom at the new shop and, and then they're going to work on insulation and then electrical. Okay. So progress is happening. Um, not quite as fast as I would like, but um, you can't complain when complain whenever uh, you've got uh, help <laughs> and it's yes, you're not paying for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Dad's for the wind. <laughs> yeah. Say I was booking my dad the other day to come in and help with um, putting up a new wall in my shop or replacing <clears throat> a wall to be more specific. Um, this shop used to be horse stalls and mm-hmm. that was probably 10 or 20 years ago. And since then it's been like a carpentry shop and um, apparently there used to be skateboard ramps in here at some point. Um, okay. But anyway, so there is, when I first took over the shop, there was one horse stall that was left with like the original um, wood planking. We think the wood planking was actually like rough hewn by hand off of this property a long time ago, which is kind of mm-hmm. cool. It's some really cool lumber, but it's also hard to clean. And it's, you know, basically just a half wall that goes up. But inside that horse stall, that's where we've put all of our, our dirty stuff. We affectionately refer to it as the dirty dungeon. It's got my belt grinders and polishing wheel and sandblaster and, you know, all mm-hmm. the stuff you don't want mixing with the, the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. And it definitely does help contain the mess, but it's only a half wall. The, the bottom half is wall. The top half is iron bars. And gotcha. that's less than ideal from a keeping dust contained standpoint. So we are going yeah. to replace that stall wall with a real wall and we are going to sound insulate it. Because the air compressor is also in that room. Yeah, which you still might want to <coughs> um, build something around that air compressor for while you're in there. Because while sound deadening that room will help, it'll also mean that when that air compressor goes, it'll be even louder in there. So, Yeah, but most of this, that that's true. You're not wrong. Um, my thought process was that room is going to be loud no matter what you're doing in there whether you're running a grinder anyway. So you probably want hearing <clears throat> protection anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. <laughs> I, I will say this though. One thing we did in our shop uh, is we just had a piece of OSB and we stuck it to, against the side of the machine and it, it it's literally open to air, but it blocked the sound and the direction yeah. of the, of where we were working and it, it reduced it by a noticeable amount. And so <coughs> even even if you just end up putting like a couple sheets around it and you leave the top open, mm-hmm. it'll probably still uh, help it a lot. Yeah. One thing I did talk to my dad about doing too was to put a um, to put the compressor in its own little room and then put a vent fan. So we mm-hmm. can either vent it to the outside if it is cold outside or, or excuse me, if hot. it is hot outside. Um, if the shop is hot, we want the heat from the air compressor going outside, or we can close that and keep the the air compressor heat inside. Yeah. So my local machine shop, they've got two rotary screw compressors and they built a a room for them and they've got a exhaust fan that's blowing out and an exhaust fan that's blowing into the shop. And they basically have a thermostat depending on the temperature of the, the shop. Um, it'll blow when it gets too hot and the little, room it'll either blow it outside or into the shop okay so they just have a a temperature controlled for which direction it goes which is really smart when i used to work at chick-fil-a um i always thought it was dumb that it would be like the middle of winter it'd be dead winter and we would be running the air conditioner Mm -hmm. because we had the freezers in there we had a bunch of freezers and the freezers would pull the heat out of the freezer and then dump it into the you know the room that the, like into the kitchen and then we would have to air condition the kitchen and then all of this would be while it was you know negative 10 degrees outside it's mm-hmm. just like we're making we're just spending energy to you know chase heat in a circle yes but i will say um 
that is probably the most efficient AC unit <laughs> that when it's running when it's cold out and it's because it's dumping heat outside. So, anyways, just kind no. Of so the, our freezers dumped heat inside. Oh yes, yeah. but when they yeah yeah when the AC is running with a, a 120 degree temperature difference or whatever, yeah, it's yeah, running yeah. very efficiently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. That's the, that's the kind of stuff you think about in the summertime where you're like, man, I wish it was cold enough that my yeah. AC would actually function well. So, just kind of funny. But yeah, no, you could bypass the whole thing by just opening the freezer up. The outside, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or having some yeah. sort of heat exchanger or something. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. But, okay. Um, yeah. What else you got? Have you ever done any uh, MPT threads on your mill? Yes, I have. How do you do them? Do you tap them? I need to do eighth inch MPT both in peak plastic and in titanium. Okay. So I have done it two different ways. I have done it with a cut tap that is an actual tap for tapping MPT. Mm -hmm. It's got the taper into the tap. And I have done it where I have thread milled it. Okay. And by far my favorite method has been thread milling. Okay. And what you have to do to thread mill is you have to model your hole on the, on, with the actual taper. Mm -hmm. And then when you select that and thread mill it, it'll match that taper. Okay. So that the, the thread mill profile will realize that there is a taper there and automatically cut the same size groove depth um, all the way up. Okay. Did you use just like a single point uh, single thread point. mill? Okay, that's what I was hoping to do. I have a thread mill that should work, mm -hmm. um, but I was that kind was of actually the, curious how that worked. That was actually why we bought our first thread mill was to tap MPT tapped holes because uh, we didn't want to... It was going to cost just as much to buy the MPT tap as it was to buy a single form, mm -hmm. and uh, we went the single form wrap. The only reason I ended up buying the other tap... MPT because it wasn't technically MPT, it was some British tap. BSP. And it was a BSP or something, and it, it was a uh, instead of being a sixty degree uh, tooth profile, it was an eighty degree tooth. Profile. Oh yeah, okay. And I was like, I'm not going to use a single form, and the single form eighty to eighty degree ones were really expensive, and so I was just like, eh, I'm just going to buy the tap because I could buy a tap on McMaster. Uh, it was uncoated, and it was like. 40 bucks and like a single a single thread for thread milling was like two or three hundred bucks for the one that i could find that would work and it was just like nah it's not worth it <laughs> npts are 60 degrees right yes okay just making sure yes uh yeah yeah, yeah they should be okay i'll double check <laughs> yeah um, double check that but that's what i cut it with and it worked yeah i i Ordered my first uh, NPT Go no go gauge. Actually, I'm sorry. I believe it's just a go gauge. Yeah, yeah. But on those, yeah. Which was... is so weird. It's because they're tapered. There's like not a good way to do no go on those. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, whenever we did them, uh, I had the the other reason I did it as a thread mill instead of tapping it was because they had a flange that they wanted to mount to the bottom. Like they, they wanted it to thread into something where it would, it would basically had a rubber gasket that was smushing down on the bottom. And I basically fine tuned it because it was, I could remachine it and open it up to where it basically was bottoming out with the right amount of tension to mm. compress the, okay. the, the rubber grommet. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. I don't have, they specify a thread depth on these ones, but I don't think it's anything too crazy or critical. Yeah, with, with tapered threads, as long as the thread has formed, there's not much else beyond that. So I think I used a ball mill to interpolate the 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 tapered okay. hole, and then I used a, a single-point thread mill to, to thread it. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to look up the sizes and everything on those and probably do a test cut. Because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've only ever... Like if I've had to do MPT threads, I have just drilled a hole on my mill and then hand tapped it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to do that on these. Yep. So. Um. Yeah. Good luck with those. Um. They should come out pretty well. So 
I, I did have one where I was thread milling a part on a gun and the thread mill I was using, I, it was a, I think it was a 832 and the thread mill I was using was only good for from 44 to 40 thread, 40 threads an inch to 44 threads an inch. I grabbed the wrong one mm -hmm. and I, and I couldn't get the threads deep enough. Uh, and then I realized that I was using the wrong tool for it. And when I switched out, I was able to refine the threads. I basically pulled up both tools and looked at the oh, midpoint yeah. of the midpoint of the threading tool offset. And then I just shifted the I reran the tool path, but I just shifted it up or down by that much and it fixed it and it, it, it lined up perfectly. And so I was like, okay, that's something that I shouldn't have had to have done because I was an idiot. But at the same time, it was really cool that it was able to reline up and wasn't an issue. Yep. So. Yeah, that's the nice thing about thread milling is you can, like, it, when you're tapping, you either get it right the first time or you break your tap. With thread milling, you can screw up, you can break your thread mill, and, like, yeah. you can you can recover. If it's too tight the first time, you can make it bigger. Yep. Yeah. Thread milling is awesome until you're tapping many, 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 many holes. And you can still thread mill, but doing it as a single point doesn't make as much sense. And then you run to go up to a multi multi-thread thread mill and then it's not as bad um but taps are still way faster like, my the thing i keep running into is the thread mills i have aren't long enough for the parts that i need to make mm -hmm. um i'm doing i'm about to do another one now and it's got like it's an m3 thread that's like three quarters of an inch deep mm -hmm. and it's like first of all why second of all like i'm not gonna be able to find that thread mill there you are Three quarters in. Well, okay, we're uh, I'm mixing units here. So like 18 millimeters deep with an M3 thread. Harvey does some pretty long reach deep. That's fair. Thread thread I, mills. I, I I don't want to use that tool though. So I just bought a um, extended tap. Yeah, all all the all the thread mills that I have gotten except for one have been Harvey's. Hmm. So, um, and they've worked really well. There's a company on eBay that makes thread mills that does really well. Like I've liked their thread mills. Yeah. And they're cheap relatively. They're like 25 to 40 bucks for just about any size. As we continue to grow as a shop, I want to start having more and more tooling just around to be able to handle things. Like, like one thing that we're, I would like to do. We just had this conversation today is, um, I'd like to standardize on like the kind of metal go drills mm -hmm. for all of our drill bits, just because it seems like I always try to get like, if I think I'm only going to use a drill bit once, I'll try to get a cheaper brand. And then the next time I need it, I'm always like, oh man, I wish this was a go drill. Like, and then I end up getting the go drill at a later date anyways. And it's like, I should just got it from the get go. Yeah. Like it's more expensive. Yes. But we've gotten to the point with those drills that they last forever. I very rarely ever break a go drill. Um, in fact, knock on wood, I don't think I've actually broken a go drill in over six months. Nice. And, uh, all the go drills that we've gotten, they've just, they just keep chugging. Um, I do have one that I think has a chip tooth on it but I use it for almost everything mm -hmm. and it's still going strong. It just doesn't break chips like it used to, but it's still drilling perfectly good holes. Yep. So I just interpolate everything at this point as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would too, but a lot of my holes are very big and um, which I guess could be an argument that more for, yeah, say so my pro. But I run into length versus diameter issues with holes. That's what forces me to drill. Yeah, no, I I like drilling. I it's so much faster, and for us, it's more of a time thing than it yeah. is uh, anything else. We're we're going for volume of parts uh, more than high dollar parts at a lower volume. Yep, and that's where where our shops are different. I'm removing teeny tiny amounts of material and taking a very long time to do so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whereas I, if I have a part that's running for over uh, 30 minutes or over 
uh, yeah, 30 minutes is kind of the tipping point where it's like, okay, this is taking a while. So, but yeah, I, so you were talking about um, standardizing drills. I think I'm going to start standardizing on Harvey tools. I was kind of trying to avoid it, but their, their catalog and stuff is just easier to use than other companies. Like it's it's a dumb reason to do it, but like their catalog is easy to use. It's easy to find what you want. They have everything that that I need and Mm -hmm. they're good tools. So, yeah. I absolutely love them. I use their uh, one. Uh, one of my customers has a <coughs> lot of stainless steel parts that are slot mm-hmm. that are have, have a slot in them, and I use the Harvey Long Reach three thirty second end mill that's three quarters of an inch long, um, stub nose stub uh, stub flutes but long reach. Yeah. And I absolutely love that tool. Like, like I broke the first one really, really fast because I was had the wrong speeds and speeds. But as soon as I got my feeds and speeds dialed in, like they last for freaking ever. Yep, I um, <laughs> I ordered two Harvey Tool Extended Reach one thirty second inch end mills. Um, the first one I ordered, I don't know, I don't know if I just like fat fingered what I ordered and ordered the wrong one, or if I just like wrote down the wrong number or something. I, I don't know what I did, but I ordered a um, extended reach one thirty second inch end mill and it got here and it was too short. Um, I would have been able to ship both of my parts yesterday, but I ordered the wrong stupid tool. And so I had to reorder it and it showed up today, but yeah, I had a half inch long one thirty second inch end mill. Where do you order your tools from? More, most These usually. ones I just got from MSC. Okay. Cause we order all of our Harvey tools through MSC as well yeah i i was talking to a distributor of harvey and a couple other companies that i use um, and i probably should order through them but msc is easier yeah we order a lot of stuff through msc and what's nice is they usually have free next day or two day shipping on pretty much for you for for us yes i think i pay like 12 dollars for next day shipping all, all of our stuff, we've we've crossed the threshold where um, McMaster, which you already had, uh, but for McMaster for us is now next day and um, without extra cost and um, MSC is next day. That's nice. And so is Haas. Haas and McMaster, Haas and MSC, we get free next day shipping. Um, so... It's yeah, I, uh, it's I, super nice. I use the Haas free next day, and that's been really nice. I've been ordering yeah. my, my drills and taps from them um, mm-hmm. for that reason, and collets. Haas is probably the first place I check 90% of the time because they're usually the cheapest, and I've been very happy with all their tools. Um, but if I want quality or specialty, then I'll go somewhere else. So, Yeah, part of my problem is everything I order at this point is specialty. Yeah. So yep. I can't really use them for end mills. Though actually I do need some like just jelly bean eighth inch end mills. I ran out of those apparently. And mm-hmm. that would be a good thing to get from Haas. Yeah. So we've <laughs> because of the deflection that's in the Tormach, I've almost stopped using the face mills. And also because it's like a forty second tool change time mm-hmm. um to load it up and then switch back to another tool. And so I basically eliminate 40 seconds and that covers any of the extra time um, that is lost from just using our quarter inch end mill to face all the parts. Yep. Unless you get to a certain size, but. Or you want the aesthetic of the big. Yeah. But the thing with the, the, the end mills comes out flatter because it has less deflection than the face mill, but the face mill does look prettier. Yes. So, but anyways, it's one of those things where, uh, I cannot wait till I get a bigger, heavier machine. Yeah. So. <laughs> You're gonna put like a 12 inch face mill in that thing, knowing you No, uh, two and a half inch is the maximum you could put in until you have to designate it as a oh, large tool and yeah. you lose three pockets. So, okay. so, Although, speaking of pockets and tool changers, 
Uh, PSA for those listening, Haas has revamped their mini mills and the super mini mill now has a side mount tool changer again. So it had it for a while back and I want to say 2015, 16 timeframe. And then they took it off and put to, went back to an umbrella style, but they have added it back very recently. It's like 36 tools too. It's, it's 30 tools, I believe. I think we but, talked about this the other day and I checked it as 36, but I could be wrong. Um, if, it, if it's 36, then it'll have more than my new it, machine and that'll make me mad. <laughs> it it makes that machine so much more usable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It it takes it up to another tier. And, and I had a conversation with someone about it and I was wondering if Haas did that to compete more with the Tormox and the Siles um, because... I know they brought they, they they had the machine and then it was robbing sales from their VF series so they got rid of it. But I wonder mm. if they brought it back because the VF series are only three phase and they don't have anything single phase with the side mount tool changer and that's the only machine you can get in single phase phase with a side mount tool changer. Well, oh, you're right. It is thirty. I lied. Uh, unless there's options to option it up more. Um, the super mini mills are all three phase. Oh, they are? Yeah. The mini mill, no super, can be single phase. The super mini mill oh. is all three phase. I didn't realize the super was three phase. I thought it was still single. Nope. That's um, annoying. But, like, in terms of packing a large amount of value into a small space, like, that super mini mill is pretty good. As long as you aren't making, I don't know, big stuff. The stuff that I don't make. Mm-hmm. They also they increased the base mini mill speed from six thousand RPM to eight thousand RPM. Oh, that's pretty good. Pretty good little improvement. Mm-hmm. Um. So I've been thinking about one of my next major purchases, and what's it's that? not going to be a, a mini mill. Um, what's it? What's it going to be? I need metrology stuff, and. Okay. Particularly, like, so we were talking on the Discord about this the other day. That uh, peak part that I'm making has some um, awfully hard to measure features. And basically, the only way to do it is optically. Okay. And um, I don't have an optical system now. I, I think I found an optical comparator that I can, well, not borrow, but go over and use Mm-hmm. Um, to measure it, but I'm going to need something optical for measuring in the near future here. Um, I I have never used an optical comparator, but that is, a, that is a piece of equipment that I would love to understand and play with at some point. I have not used one outside of school. It has been a long time since I've used one. And it was basically just like a, hey, here's an optical comparator. This is what it do. Um. But I was looking at measuring microscopes. So either like a traditional toolmaker's microscope that has um, like a micrometer on the side of it. Or Mm -hmm. what I was leaning towards more was a digital measuring microscope. Where that's, Mm -hmm. then you can like stick your part underneath it and like literally trace out the circles and the sides and it'll measure everything for you. And I was excited about that because that would basically generate like a CMM style report that I could just Mm -hmm. send to Zometry in lieu of like their inspection template. Um, But then someone pointed out that those things don't work on even moderately large parts. Um, And by moderately large, I mean more than like an inch. Oh yeah. So the field of view is just too small. Um, So I think, I think that microscope is out unfortunately. And so I'm back to optical comparators. My only, real option yeah i don't know enough about optical comparators to even know what would be a good brand for those i mean there's always been a toyo like it's an easy go-to mm-hmm. um micon zeiss i don't know they're, they're, i haven't really looked that into it but i did some quick googling i think it's going to come down to whatever i can find used <laughs> so yep there seems to be a pretty good selection in my area, actually. Like, kind of a surprisingly good selection of used optical comparators. Um, 
Yeah, when when we build out our new shop, I'm going to have a room dedicated for inspection equipment, and I'd like to get an optical comparator and uh, stick it in there at some point. And along with other, I'd like to get a granite plate, a, a, a granite table, and then a height gauge. What's that one that uh, Saunders has? I think it's a Mitsutoyu. Yes, the digital height uh, gauge. I think it is. Yeah. Those are pretty sweet. They're expensive. The digital ones, like the fancy ones like his, it'll automatically do like um, yeah, diameter measurement and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I think those are they, more expensive than the optical comparators I'm looking at. They float on a on an air bearing, which is pretty cool too. That is cool. So. Um, yeah, I haven't gotten deep enough to... My computer yeah. just made a very loud noise in my ear. Um, I haven't gotten deep enough to really dial or to know what I want yet. Um, I probably need to talk to some salespeople. And I what I, I really wish IMTS was sooner because I probably need to make this purchase before IMTS. But that's also the best time to go look at everything. So we went to that Haas demo day back in October. Mm-hmm. And they had a couple CMMs. I want to say it was a Zeiss, but it might have been something else. I'd have to go look through the brochures, but they weren't as expensive as I was expecting. You could get you could get a a shop floor model for under fifty. Yeah, uh, which is not cheap, but it's also not outrageous. So. I, sorry, I'm going back a topic here because I've been browsing while we've been talking. Is there not a Mini Mill 1 versus a Mini Mill 2 anymore? No, Are they, they all just of, the Mini Mill? They did. They got rid of that when they did the redesign. So that is, the, that is the one downsize is that you can't get one with extended travels anymore. Huh. So they're, are they all the smaller one or are they all the big one? I think they're all the smaller one. Interesting. So you do get the side mount, but you don't get the extended travels because... The Super Mini Mill 2, I believe, had a 28 by 12 or 16, something like that, is what it used to be. It basically was like a DT2 size table, Mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Well, that gives you the, at very least, on the regular Mini Mill, it lets you get a 20 tool ATC. Yes. Which for me right now is basically the minimum. Yeah, so a regular mini mill goes you can go from a 10 to a 20, so you can get a larger umbrella style. For the super speed, it's standard is the side mount 30. Huh. That's cool. Those are cool machines. I wish I mm-hmm. I had the excuse to buy one of those. Yeah. So I'd 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 still like the uh the DT and or brother style machines at some mm-hmm. point. Some something like that. I do wonder if the new redesigned um, mini mills fix the door axis issues. Cause it looks like from their photos that the spindle is in line with the door where before the spindle was like beside the door. Oh, so it's just kind of annoying to work in. Yes. So like the problem that I have with the one that I use at the university is that like when the door is fully open, the spindles basically, instead of being centered in the door, it's like offset to the side of the door when it's fully opened. Okay. So it's not centered. The door is not centered on the column. If that makes sense. That is weird. So that was very, that is very, very annoying. So. So speaking of mini mills, have you been using wear comp? (laughs) <laughs> so wear comp that is something that i have struggled with for a long time it's something that i never used on the on the uh Tormach just mm-hmm. because i could never get it figured out um but i started wanting to use it on the um haas mini mill because i was going to try to use in process probing to update wear comp Okay. Because we now have the machining extension, and with us getting a new machine, um, that's going to have a probe and all the fancy features. I wanted to play around with wear comp, and I couldn't get it to work. And so, 
me and Dylan went back and forth and we were getting confused because, or I was getting confused. He was, he was fine. I was confused <laughs> because we were talking about in controller and in computer. And I was talking about it in terminologies of like fusion. And I think he was talking about it in terms of on the actual controller. Yeah. And so, like, he would say a comment on something, and I would misunderstand it as, like, on Fusion. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand that or, you know, whatever. But we eventually got it all figured out. And the big... <laughs> so, to, to kind of give people an overview of at least my basic understanding of it at this point. Um, if you use in computer, the computer will compute everything and tell the tool exactly what it needs to do. When you do in controller, it'll put the tool path on the edge of whatever it's cutting. And then your controller will use the diameter of the tool plus the um, where column to come up with the tool path for cutting it. When you use where, you need to set your diameter to zero because Fusion will calculate the center of the tool path. And it'll add the wear offset to it. So it, it, it calculates it exactly like as if it was in computer. But it also accounts for uh, having it. Uh, it also uses the wear on the controller. But it also uses the diameter. Which is the problem I was running into. Because my diameter values. I was measuring the, the, the length and the diameter. Mm -hmm. And so it was using both those values. And the hole I was trying to cut. It thought that it was too small for the tool. Uh, and so it was airing out on the, the Haas. And so if you want to use the where, and I'm sorry if I'm making this more complicated than actually explaining. If you want to use the where on Fusion, you basically have to set the diameter field to zero and then only use the where column to offset a minor amount, um, depending on what your tool is actually cutting. Yeah. So if you're using in, con in computer where comp, aka no where comp, then... It doesn't matter what you have in the machine. It'll be ignored. If you're exactly. using in controller, then it'll use both the diameter and the where column. If you are using where, then you need to set the diameter to zero and just use the where column. Correct. Yeah. So that's, that's the simple version of it. Um, I would like to still measure the diameter and there's actually a setting you can, there's some stuff you can change in fusion to, or not in Fusion, in the Haas controller to where when you measure the diameter, it'll compare what the expected diameter is compared to the measure diameter and automatically update the uh, tool diameter with the difference. Yes. And so basically it treats the tool diameter as a wear column, but you also have the wear column that you can also update. So you have two columns that are getting added together to do your wear total wear offset. Um, and the only reason I kind of like using this idea and as as Dylan, who is if he's listening to this podcast, has pointed out and makes so much sense. Um, that's basically what in control is already, and so there's like no point in changing that setting. The only thought process I have to that is I like setting all of my diameters to zero and having the controller automatically updated a little bit. But as Dylan was saying, if I if you load if you program for a different tool then what's in the machine, it'll, uh, and you don't measure the diameter in the machine. So let's say I'm using tool, you know, four, and previously it was a three eighths and I changed it to a quarter, but I didn't update the diameter. If you're using where, uh, it doesn't matter. You don't have to update the diameter. It'll always be at zero. Um, and so you don't have to measure the diameter ever. Um, you only have to update the where, but I do like the ability to update where potentially. So my thought by having it, having the ability to, to measure the diameter is that if I wanted to, I could measure the diameter and it wouldn't break my program. Or I could set the diameters to zero and never measurement and just use where normally. Yeah. It basically gives me the option to go both ways at any point. Yeah, right now I use um, in controller if I use anything at all. Um, and that has worked really well for me. Now, again, I, I was talking to Dylan about this and he pointed out that there's a little bit more danger doing in control compensation versus wear offsets. 
Because if your wear offset, let's say you forget to reset it and it had an offset in there already, like, oh no, your part may come out too thou undersized or too thou oversized. Mm -hmm. Um, However, if you use the wrong diameter value or leave it set to zero, you can be crashing your machine. So Mm -hmm. he has a very valid point there that using the controller is more dangerous. Um, And I probably should change around my macros to do the thing, to do everything the way he suggests, like he's definitely doing it the right way. Um, in the meantime, I've been doing it the easy way and it has been working really, really well for me. Uh, being able to measure the tools on the Renishaw probe and then run them, like it's it's really close basically every time. Um, and it actually saved me the other day. I accidentally loaded a three millimeter end mill instead of an eighth inch end mill. And, but because I measured it, the machine just offset the right amount and my part came out on spec, even though I loaded the wrong tool. Yeah. It's stuff like that that I want to have that process reliability. But I do like the idea of never having to measure the diameter and having it default to zero. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm torn. But in the meantime, I'm just going to keep doing things the way I'm doing them because they're working. The other day, mm-hmm. I, I loaded a new end mill and I made a part. And on the very first like attempt at the finishing pass, it was dead on um, to as fine as my micrometer could read. That's awesome. so it's like that that makes me happy and i admit there's a certain amount of luck to make that happen like the stars have to align for that to happen um but that was very satisfying now does does haas have the feature where it adds in the steps that are on the tormach whenever you yeah it adds the nice little stuff. jagged edge not that i've noticed <laughs> which has also been a very nice feature also the holes are round unlike my tormach <laughs> <laughs> Which granted, that's just a maintenance thing on my Tormach, but if I tell it to give me a round hole, it gives me a round hole. Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, I I <laughs> I love bashing on the Tormach, but it's built our business. Yeah. So it's 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 been a great machine, but I was joking with someone the other day that we're gonna have to take it out in the field and shoot it at some <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> just cause like it's one of those things where I have it, it's it's been a great machine. It's served us well. It's built the company, um, and it's it's built our confidence in machining. And so the the role that Tormach is trying to fill, it has a hundred percent made and exceeded. But I'm to the point now where I'm I need more. <laughs> yeah, and I'm getting more. I just don't have it yet, which is which is making it worse because yes. like. <laughs> Now, now I'm anticipating the new machine, and so every time I look at the old machine, it's like you make me sick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie. I have like, I guess a hesitance to use the Tormach whenever I need to use it. I'm always like, oh, I'm going back to the Tormach. I just want to use the Haas for everything. Like that—that mm-hmm. that is a very real thing that I feel when I have to do stuff. And like today, I definitely should have set up the fidget cubes. And I had time, but I was just like, I don't want to use the Tormach, and so I didn't set them up. <laughs> so. Are those not done? How far are those along? Uh, uh, they're the same place they were two weeks ago, which is, uh, I think it's all of the op ones and half of the op twos. It might be all of the op twos and half of the op threes. Gotcha. Um, you did so. Wait, you did most of that on the the Haas, didn't you? Yes. Okay. But I had to tear it down to make parts. And I like the Haas is still what's making me money right now, mostly. And so I don't want to put them back on the Haas. So I need to get a move back to the Tormach. Is having them cut on two different machines going to produce two different finishes or qualities? Um, maybe a little bit. I'm just going to tumble them in walnut shells and it'll be fine. Okay. I did some tests. It, it evens everything out. Okay. Well, that's good. You need to get those done. Yeah, <laughs> I know I it's do. I know it's annoying, but it's hard to make parts that aren't making me money anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And granted, I've already been paid for them, so like they did make me money. But yeah. they're it's, yeah, it's, I just need to do it before Scott yeah. murders me. Yeah, because that's the other thing; it doesn't come back to me anymore, and that's yeah. why. Yeah, so I just need to finish those. Yeah, you just need to get them done. You need to you need to grind them out, get them done, um, keep Scott happy and keep the customers who bought them happy yeah. um, because you, you owe it to them because they did buy your product. Yep. So once I, once I get them set up, it's just mindless running them. 
and you know every couple of minutes i go back over there throw on a new cube hit go and like Mm -hmm. i'll I'll just slowly get them all knocked out but i'll put that on my list for first thing tomorrow before i do anything else good Good. Um, keep keep them going don't don't drag it out because it'll only get worse the longer you don't do them yeah i know so get them done close that close that uh, project and move on to the next i i have the same problem to be fair with a different project for a customer and it just keeps getting drawn out because it's an outsourced process and i have to make i'm doing the design work and then installing it but i have to outsource parts of it and the outsourcing is about a two-week turnaround typically and so it's like a project that i'd quoted for like back in september before or august or september before we got super busy has basically been kicking the can down the road for like a couple months at this point and it's like this just needs to be done and off my plate and you know make the customer happy make me happy because i still haven't got paid for any of the work that we've done so far and it's just like And it's, it's a low value, low dollar item, but it's just been time consuming and annoying and I just need to get it done and off the plate. Yep. Do you have like anodization vendors that you work with? I've had like four. Okay. And none Oh of yeah, them yeah. I, I remember some of the saga. <laughs> and none of them I have ever used for Zometry. Okay. So Zometry, I believe... You can call them and they can hook you up with people that are in their network. Mm -hmm. But I've never done that. I was talking to um, Nick from P3D Creations. Is that his shop? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Nick from somewhere. And he showed me, um, for legal reasons, not Zometry jobs, that he had taken. And a large percentage of them had... um, some sort of coding on them. And he does a lot of zometry work. Yeah. Well, we do have a local shop that does anodizing. They only do black, clear, and either red or green. Something like That's that. That's interesting. Um, and we've had some stuff anodized through them. Um, they're the most industrial company that we've used. And I can actually go drop off and pick up parts. Okay. But there's they're the only one within like a three or four hour drive of our shop. So, which is why when we move to the new shop, if I can find space for it, um, I'd love to set up anodizing because I feel like that'd be a service that if I can machine and anodize parts in house, like I don't know anyone anywhere remotely close to me that has both those capabilities under one roof. Yeah. Um, it is Nick from P3D. I was I had that correct. Uh, he's the guy with the Kern. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I was just thinking, I probably need to build a relationship with these companies before I need them urgently for a zometry part. Yeah. Um, and I was just kind of like trying to figure out the best way to do that. Like maybe I just send them a couple cubes and be like, anodize these. Yeah. Except the cubes are probably the worst thing to anodize because there's no way to hold them. But um, like I probably need to have some just nonsense part that i send them just to kind of get that ball rolling and learn what they're like to work with there's ways you can get things anodized without holes and it still come out pretty well i would love to that's another reason i want to play around with anodizing because i feel like i feel like i have the same problem with anodizers that i had when i outsourced machine parts to some of the local shops at my old job they would look at the part and say it couldn't be done and then it's like I could send it to another shop and it'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like anodizers, like a lot of the issues I've run in with anodizers, they're like, there's no way to hold it. And then I send it to another shop and they're like, oh, yeah, it's not a problem. It's just like, okay. I I wonder if part of the problem with anodizing is there's just less of a community. Like with machining, yeah. like we all talk to each other. We have podcasts. Like we, you know, have the Insta Machinist Discord um there's practical machinists Mm -hmm. if you hate yourself and like we all talk to each other we show each other ways of doing things there's youtube videos um there's some really good youtube videos there's some less good youtube Mm -hmm. videos there's some really good podcasts there's some less good podcasts i'll i'll let you decide 
uh, listeners. <laughs> um, and like, I just don't think that exists for anodizing. Like, I don't think like there's probably some people out there, but I don't think there's a large community of people who are doing anodizing that are really into it. Yeah. 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 That's sad, but true. I'm afraid. I mean, I guess there's like the 10 year old John Grimsmo videos, but yeah. like those are still some of the best videos about high end anodizing on YouTube, mm-hmm. which is a shame because they're not great videos. <laughs> Sorry. 10 yeah. year old or not 10 year old John, but 10 a year ago, John, he looks like he's 10 years old. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, it's a, it's it's the sad reality of it. And the the problem is is that because it's such a low cost service, you usually get low cost quality control. Yep. Part of me wants to start an anodization shop and like my whole thing is going to be we are the most expensive shop you could possibly go to. <laughs> and like then you know do you know do the work well yeah do like pictures off- along the way and or at least offer like a like a insurance I, I had that thought too yeah where it's like we will insure uh you can pay to have all your parts insured um and it costs um 10% of the value of your part or 5% of the value of your part, or, you know, you come up with a percentage based on how much it would cost to replace the part. And you say, you know, we'll cover. And, and then based on your rejection quality rates, you can kind of figure out what that percentage needs to be over time. Yeah. Or even just have that as a standard thing built into your pricing. Be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we charge 20 times what everybody else charges, but if we screw up, we will pay, you know, this pre yeah. agreed upon amount. Yep. And then you just have to really not ever screw up. Yeah. Yeah. Which I have no confidence in doing, which is why I'm not starting an anodization shop. Yeah. But somebody should do that. mm -hmm. But I mean, there's some really good anodizers out there that are in the artistic realm and they are not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. Um, But they do a really good job and see those are the people where they are charging a premium price for a product but they're doing it for an artistic, not a industrial. And they're way too high for industrial type work. Cause mm-hmm. you know, they'll, they'll charge $40 for an anodization on a single part. And it's like, okay, that's a bit high. Um, but if you're doing it as a cosmetic, like a paint job for a part that's happens to be an anodization, which is also harder. It's like, okay, that's easier to swallow because it's actually adding, it's adding value beyond just a protective coating. Yep. And uh, and if as your volumes increase, your prices decrease, which um, is also nice. But I really need to get the clear or the what is it called the e coat process set up. We have that sample, and the so we went to Fabtech. We found this process. There's like e coating. It's kind of halfway between Cerico and anodizing. Um, and we talked to a company, they absolutely had us sold and they, you know, send us a sample. Their sample came with zero documentation, none, nothing. I don't even know what product line it is off of like their oh website to look it up. Literally the bottle says matte black with no information. And Scott was supposed to follow up with them and be like, what is this stuff you sent us? Um, and, and then that went nowhere. So I need to follow up with them because that would, that would be so much better than powder coating. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're not in the product space anymore, you're probably, it's probably going to drop to a low priority. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I am still making carabiners for Scott. And if I didn't have to powder coat them, that would save me so much headache. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it still makes sense. But as time goes on, um, if that side of the business uh, doesn't grow, it'll become less as a percentage just because it's not growing. Yeah. I have already considered turning my um, powder coat booth into a metrology room because it's so small. It'd be easier to control temperature Mm -hmm. and it's um, uh, all the air going in is filtered. Mm -hmm. So, but I won't because we need to, you know, still powder coat stuff. And you don't have any metrology to put in there yet. I mean, I have hand tools and stuff. 
Oh, okay. I don't have anything wild. I don't have an optical comparator or a CMM, but... I was, I was going to say, okay, let me rephrase that. You don't have anything that would require that level of cleanliness yet. Yeah. Uh, the temperature control would still be nice for some things, but... Yeah, for some things. But I doubt... <laughs> If you're anything like me, you're probably still not to the point where you're letting. If if even if you had that space, you're probably not going to let your parts sit in there for <coughs> multiple hours before you go measure them to make sure everything's at the right level. That's probably temperature true. was. You probably just go I in mean, there grab. If the it was a part and... where I was holding tenths, then yeah, but um, yeah. so probably far just... most of my parts tend to have a plus or minus one, but not tighter than that. Will Zometry yeah. let you go tighter than that? They do now. They didn't before. Okay. Yeah. So, so they now have a. If you're quoting a part, if you or if you're uploading a part for them to quote, they now have a sub one thou, and it requires a print to quote. I believe okay. it requires manual review. I think anything minus uh, plus or minus five required a print. It might. Oh yeah, I think you're right. Anything. Yeah. It, okay. It required a print, but it would still quote it. Okay. Like it would, it would still spit out a quote. I think if you do sub a thou or sub a thou, that it requires a manual review before they'll give you a price. Because okay. they would give you a price for anything between uh, plus or minus anything under five thou to um, one thou, anything in that range. They would still give you a price, but I think if you're sub a thou, it goes to manual review. When you take Zometry jobs, do they send you emails that are like, this looks like a complicated part. Are you doing okay? No. I've gotten a, I've gotten that email for almost every part I've taken recently. <laughs> I I take that back. I think we had... We haven't had anyone say, hey, that's a complicated part. We've had a couple that have, that have like messaged us been like, hey, you know, how are you coming on this? And it's like, we box, we've made it, boxed it up and shipped it. You can see the on the website and they're like, Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> it's like... uh, I did a dumb thing the other day with Zometry that I had to fix. And it took like two days to get sorted out. Um, I was shipping a, a, a job. It was like quantity one, quantity one, quantity two. So a total of four parts, three different um, part numbers. And when I first went to generate the label, it, it failed on me. It was like, can't generate label. And so then I had to generate a second label. And when you generate the second label, you have to manually type the quantities of each part that you're shipping. Now, I just typed 111 and, and shipped the package, but I shipped the proper quantity and, mm -hmm. you know, didn't think about it. And I was like, why is Zometry taking so long to get this job off my job board? Like, I want to be able to take more jobs, but I'm capped because I'm still a, a noob and Eventually I got a, um, they sent me one of those like emails that was like, is, is this job going to ship on time? Yes or no. And I was like, it's already shipped. What are you talking about? And I, I went back and I looked and I caught it. And so I, I sent them an email and they like two days later, they did an answer. And so then I had to call them. And just today, the day that it was supposed to ship, they finally got that cleared off and sorted out. Yeah. Like that's a so, dumb mistake. I'm not going to do again. I, I have found with Zometry that if you call and get someone on the phone, it is way faster than any emails. And so anytime I have any issue with Zometry, I default to calling them. And then I, uh, although they do have a, now have like an online chat thing hmm. where you can talk to a live person through, through like a text box. And that does pretty well. Yeah. I, I had had to email them a couple times for random things. And then before this, it had gone well. This is the first time I've just never gotten a response. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll probably call them more in the future. <clears throat> yep. Um, I think that's about all I got. Just pounded away. Um, going to be putting in a lot of hours. Going to be getting up early. Uh, cause we were, I think I mentioned this already, but we were booked up all the way until Friday next week. And then we had a rush order that came in of 15, 15 one off parts. <laughs> and it's just one quantity one on everything. And it's, it's not a lot of time, but it is just because they're all different. So it's a lot of programming times. So it was yep. one, one part, but 15 times or 15 quantity of 15, it'd be, 
real easy to do. So, yeah, I'm a little bit hamstrung by not having the tools that I need yet. They should be showing up tomorrow. Um, let's, I have just two jobs on my job board right now. One of which I just took, you know, 20 minutes before getting on the podcast. And I think I can do it with everything that I have already. So I may yeah. kind of have this one skip the line so I can start working on it. Um, it is, it's, I finally found another job that'll let me use that big chunk of titanium that I bought. Um, oh, I probably need to buy another bandsaw blade because I killed my bandsaw blade with that last time. Oh, we, speaking of bandsaw blades, we had our bandsaw blade snap the other day. Oh, yeah. so we, we had another one, but we're going to have to order another replacement because, uh, we don't have any extras after this one. I, I was looking for nicer blades for my bandsaw for cutting titanium. Mm -hmm. And I just like, can't find anything. McMaster might have some that might work better, but they're like $80 a blade or something like that. And I don't really know. So it's like, well, I guess I'll just keep buying $20 blades and replace it every time after I do a titanium job. Speaking of, of bandsaws, I will say this. When we move into the new shop, we are... Our next piece of equipment we might get is probably going to be the Tormach automatic bandsaw. Okay, nice. Because it is the cheapest automatic bandsaw, and we don't really need anything cut at an accuracy greater than like a 16th or an 8th inch. Mm -hmm. We can get by with that. I've heard and the only problem you run into with those is, is if you're cutting really short parts, like under an inch. Otherwise, they're they're pretty great. Yeah. I, uh, I don't think we really cut anything under an inch very often, if ever. I don't know if we've cut anything less than an inch. I was thinking. Usually... Of... Go ahead. I was thinking about. I don't know if I'm going to need my bandsaw anymore, or at least be using it much. Yeah, I we're we're going to be using a bandsaw. We are. We have so much material in the in the old shop right now. It's insane. I mean, it's insane for us. Like, I'm sure if most people looked at it, they'd be like, "Oh, that's a." small amount of material but for for how much revenue is flowing through the shop and how much uh money we've made versus how much you know it's probably i don't know 10 5 to 10 percent of our annual budget is sitting Oof. on Ouch. the wall or in the corner as a as a percentage of like total cash flow and it's just that just seems very high yes uh but that's just because we've been buying full sticks of material and not using them. Um, although the nice thing is, is we've been doing that in this rush job that rush job that came in um, 80% of the material we already had. And so um, there was only one piece of material and one tool that we had to order. And so like the more we get stuff like that, the more I'm glad we have the material on hand. Cause it's like, it's going to make that job a very profitable job because we'll have very low expenses um, and we get the rush fee. So that'll be nice. Yeah. You should like go out there with a, a label maker and put the date on all of your material. And it's got the PO number on them. Well, put like today's date on them and check back in in three months or something and be like, well, you know, if that date is still there, then. Oh, we've got scrap it. We've got material that we ordered um, whenever we were doing the deck defenders from two years ago. I'm trying to give you a way of knowing when to scrap the material and instead of moving it around for you know oh, six yeah. and a half years. Yeah, uh, I think once we get uh, an ERP system like um, Pro Shop, we'll be able to print out for ports and check that stuff a lot better. Because we'll see what material we have in there and how much we've burned through in a period of time and actually run reports on that kind of stuff. So that's something that we've 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 been joking in the shop every time we have to go hunt for material. We're like, oh, just look at Pro Shop because yeah. we don't we don't have Pro Shop, but it's that's something that we're gonna probably have at some point next year as well. Another another item that we would like to get next year. I still need to put my tooling in Airtable. To just keep track of what I have on hand. Um, 
because I don't yeah. do that well right now. And I end up like buying redundant tools or thinking I have a tool that I don't have. Mm-hmm. So I need yeah. to spend, you know, four hours and get that stuff put in there. Yeah. Once, once, once we get a, uh, an ERP system and our first employee and moved into the, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen, <laughs> but we have a lot of plans for next year. So we'll just see. My plan for next year is to make parts. That's my plan. Grow your job shop business. At this point, so. my goal is to stabilize. That's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you confidently say that it has been a profitable increase to switch to job shop? Yes. Can you, if you could get, how many how many jobs a week would you need to be comfortable? Depends on Did the job. Figure it out? Huh? So it depends on the job. Well, you could probably in, average it out. In a perfect world, well, okay, with, let me pull up uh, Airtable here. I guess we can look at reality versus goals. Um if we look at at goals, I would be very happy if it worked out to be one job a week, but a high value job. You know, let me sit down and focus on one job for the whole week. I would love that. Um, let's see, where's the right thing? So let's see, my average average net profit is probably what I want to look at. But hopefully as you grow and uh, take on more work, that will stabilize. And I think once you get out of the probation period and the job board opens up, you'll find a lot more options on there. Yeah, with the jobs that I have been taking lately, which have been lower dollar dollar value than I would like because I haven't had access to the full dollar or the whole board, I need to be doing about, uh, call it two and a half at absolute bare minimum. So two and a half or three jobs, bare minimum, uh, maybe four to be comfortable. But if that could be, if they could all be like this, you know, this plastic job I'm working on, that number could be one at a bare minimum. Yeah. So just look, just looking through all of our statements from Zometry, just kind of glancing at them. I'd say the average dollar value amount per job that we've taken over the history of Zometry has been in the either the high 400s or the low 700s. That's probably the range of our average dollar dollar value job. I can tell you mine right now. It is currently uh, $638 is my average job value. Okay. Um, I wonder what happens right. if I filter that by... Oh, you know it's the end of the podcast. We're doing math on a podcast. Um, no, I can't filter it by date with how it's currently set up. But let's yeah. see. If I just so, look at my open jobs, that's actually shockingly close. Never mind. <laughs> oh, but I have one really low dollar value. It's pulling it down. Yeah, but that's why they call it an average. Yeah, exactly. I I took one job that was under two hundred dollars though because it used the same material and tooling as a different job, and it actually mm-hmm. went to the same customer. It was the same shipping address. Yeah, as a general rule, um, in our shop, at least with Zometry, I've tried to avoid anything under like a hundred to two hundred dollar range from Zometry. Um, that's just. That's just parts that are usually not worth my time, even if they are ridiculously simple parts. Um, they they usually between the the getting the material, digging it out, programming it, running it, inspecting it, packaging it up, and shipping it. Usually, the grand sum of all of those, even if it's material that I have on time on on hand, um, and even if every step in that process took me a minimal amount of time. It's still pretty close. It's still going to probably take me at least an hour, hour and a half. And at that point, it's it's borderline not worth it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I need to set some more hard guidelines. Because, you know, I have the advice from Surven that's like, don't take low-paying jobs. But nowhere have I sat down and defined, okay, under $500 is a low-paying job. 
Um, and I think I need to put some of those rules in place for myself. So what I would do, what I would recommend is I would look at it and go, what is the simplest job that I could do? And what is the average time it would take me to do each step? And then what is the dollar rate I want to earn? And then go, okay, anything below that value, um, no matter how simple the part is, quite frankly, based off the numbers, there's no way I can make that profitable for what I'm trying to do. Yeah. And you'll, you, you know, you'll come out to some dollar value amount and you'll be like, okay, I will never accept a job where, um, it's under, you know, a hundred bucks or 130 bucks. Because if you, after you add up everything that I have to do at every single stage, even if I'm going as fast as possible, um, I'm either pushing myself really hard and so it becomes a pressure just to get it done, just to make any money. Or if I go at my average speed, I'm I'm losing money yeah. or, or not, not making very much where it's not worth my time. Yep. And I'm definitely slow at all this stuff, though, getting much faster. I'm literally probably twice as fast as I was at the beginning of the month right now. Um, and, except when I take these stupid jobs with stupid parts that are yeah. crazy and require at least six setups that has made me very slow. Um, but if you ever go back to the product space, uh, in full force, you will be a much better person for making product parts. Yes. Yep. So, and that's, that's why I like doing the job shop stuff. I still want to do products. I keep saying that, um, it doesn't make sense for the business as of yet but it is something that I would like to do at some point still. And who knows? Um, I had a good friend of mine who um, found a really old knife design Mm -hmm. that there's not really anyone making anymore. And he let me borrow the knife and I don't know, we might, might at some point remake a remake it into a different version. That's cool. It's it's a really unique design, and it it was a really cheap. It almost looks like like a like a cheap, um, like a World War Two, like early folding style knife. Uh, like it's kind of that vintage style, mm-hmm. um, but I haven't ever seen done in a modern way. So it'd be kind of cool to like modernize the mechanism that it uses to open and lock up. Yeah. So we'll see. It's that time. So uh, let's see here. A little over an hour. So it's about an average. It's not a long one. It's not a short one. So all of you that have held on to the end, we appreciate you uh, hanging out with us as we continue to grow and learn from week to week. Um, We ask that you uh, please like, share, and tell all your friends. And, uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time. This is Harrison with Precision Ingenuity signing out with AJ from Audacity Micro.